International Regulations for Preventing Collisions at Sea. Part A General. Rule 1. Application. A. These rules shall apply to all vessels upon the high seas and in all waters connected therewith navigable by seagoing vessels. B. Nothing in these rules shall interfere with the operation of special rules made by an appropriate authority for roadsteads, harbors, rivers, lakes or inland waterways connected with the high seas and navigable by seagoing vessels. Such special rules shall conform as closely as possible to these rules. C. Nothing in these rules shall interfere with the operation of any special rules made by the government of any state with respect to additional station or signal lights, shapes or whistle signals for ships of war and vessels proceeding under convoy, or with respect to additional station or signal lights or shapes for fishing vessels engaged in fishing as a fleet. These additional station or signal lights, shapes or whistle signals shall, so far as possible, be such that they cannot be mistaken for any light, shapes or signal authorized elsewhere under these rules. d. Traffic separation schemes may be adopted by the organization for the purpose of these rules. e. Whenever the government concerned shall have determined that a vessel of special construction or purpose cannot comply fully with the provisions of any of these rules with respect to the number, position, range or arc of visibility of lights or shapes, as well as to the disposition and characteristics of sound signaling appliances, such vessel shall comply with such other provisions in regard to the number, position, range or arc of visibility of lights or shapes, as well as to the disposition and characteristics of sound signaling appliances, as her government shall have determined to be the closest possible compliance with these rules in respect to that vessel. Rule 2. Responsibility. A. Nothing in these rules shall exonerate any vessel, or the owner, master, or crew thereof, from the consequences of any neglect to comply with these rules or of the neglect of any precaution which may be required by the ordinary practice of seamen, or by the special circumstances of the case. b. In construing and complying with these rules due regard shall be had to all dangers of navigation and collision and to any special circumstances, including the limitations of the vessels involved, which may make a departure from these rules necessary to avoid immediate danger. Rule 3. General Definitions. For the purpose of these rules, except where the context otherwise requires, a. The word vessel includes every description of water craft, including non-displacement craft, WIG, craft and seaplanes, used or capable of being used as a means of transportation on water. b. The term power-driven vessel means any vessel propelled by machinery. c. The term sailing vessel means any vessel under sail, provided that propelling machinery, if fitted, is not being used. D. The term vessel engaged in fishing means any vessel fishing with nets, lines, trawls or other fishing apparatus which restrict maneuverability, 
but does not include a vessel fishing with trolling lines or other fishing apparatus which do not restrict maneuverability. E. The word seaplane includes any aircraft designed to maneuver on the water. F. The term vessel not under command means a vessel which through some exceptional circumstance is unable to maneuver as required by these rules and is therefore unable to keep out of the way of another vessel. G. The term vessel restricted in her ability to maneuver means a vessel which from the nature of her work is restricted in her ability to maneuver as required by these rules and therefore is unable to keep out of the way of another vessel. The term vessels restricted in their ability to maneuver shall include but not be limited to 1. A vessel engaged in laying, servicing, or picking up a navigation mark, submarine cable, or pipeline. 2. A vessel engaged in dredging, surveying, or underwater operations. 3. A vessel engaged in replenishment or transferring persons, provisions, or cargo while underway. 4. A vessel engaged in the launching or recovery of aircraft. 5. A vessel engaged in mine clearance operations. 6. A vessel engaged in a towing operation, such as severely restricts the towing vessel and her tow in their ability to deviate from their course. H. The term vessel, constrained by her draft, means a power-driven vessel, which because of her draft in relation to the available depth and width of navigable water, is severely restricted in her ability to deviate from the course she is following. I. The word underway means that a vessel is not at anchor, or made fast to the shore, or aground. J. The words length and breadth of a vessel mean her length overall and greatest breadth. K. Vessels shall be deemed to be in sight of one another only when one can be observed visually from the other. L. The term restricted visibility means any condition in which visibility is restricted by fog, mist, falling snow, heavy rainstorms, sandstorms, or any other similar causes. M. The term wing in ground, WIG, craft means a multimodal craft which, in its main operational mode, flies in close proximity to the surface by utilizing surface effect action. International Regulations for Preventing Collisions at Sea Part B Steering and Sailing Rules Section 1 Conduct of Vessels in Any Condition of Visibility Rule 4 Application Rules in this section apply in any condition of visibility Rule 5. Look out. Every vessel shall at all times maintain a proper lookout by sight and hearing as well as by all available means appropriate in the prevailing circumstances and conditions so as to make a full appraisal of the situation and of the risk of collision. Rule 6. Safe speed. Every vessel shall at all times proceed at a safe speed so that she can take proper and effective action to avoid collision and be stopped within a distance appropriate to the prevailing circumstances and conditions. In determining a safe speed, the following factors shall be among those taken into account, 
A. By all vessels. 1. The state of visibility. 2. The traffic density including concentrations of fishing vessels or any other vessels. 3. The maneuverability of the vessel with special reference to stopping distance and turning ability in the prevailing conditions. 4. At night, the presence of background light, such as from shore lights or from back scatter of her own lights. 5. The state of wind, sea and current, and the proximity of navigational hazards. 6. The draft in relation to the available depth of water. B. Additionally, by vessels with operational radar. 1. The characteristics, efficiency, and limitations of the radar equipment. 2. Any constraints imposed by the radar range scale in use. 3. The effect on radar detection of the sea state, weather, and other sources of interference. 4. The possibility that small vessels, ice, and other floating objects may not be detected by radar at an adequate range. 5. The number, location, and movement of vessels detected by radar. 6. The more exact assessment of the visibility that may be possible when radar is used to determine the range of vessels or other objects in the vicinity. Rule 7. Risk of Collision. A. Every vessel shall use all available means appropriate to the prevailing circumstances and conditions to determine if risk of collision exists. If there is any doubt, such risk shall be deemed to exist. B. Proper use shall be made of radar equipment if fitted and operational, including long-range scanning to obtain early warning of risk of collision and radar plotting or equivalent systematic observation of detected objects. C. Assumptions shall not be made on the basis of scanty information, especially scanty radar information. D. In determining if risk of collision exists the following considerations shall be among those taken into account. 1. Such risk shall be deemed to exist if the compass bearing of an approaching vessel does not appreciably change. 2. Such risk may sometimes exist even when an appreciable bearing change is evident particularly when approaching a very large vessel or a tow or when approaching a vessel at close range. Rule 8. Action to avoid collision. A. Any action to avoid collision shall be taken in accordance with the rules of this part and shall, if the circumstances of the case admit, be positive, made in ample time and with due regard to the observance of good seamanship. B. Any alteration of course and or speed to avoid collision, shall, if the circumstances of the case admit, be large enough to be readily apparent to another vessel observing visually or by radar, a succession of small alterations of course and or speed should be avoided. C. If there is sufficient sea room, alteration of course alone may be the most effective action to avoid a close quarters situation provided that it is made in good time, is substantial, and does not result in another close quarters situation. D. Action taken to avoid collision with another vessel shall be such as to result in passing at a safe distance. The effectiveness of the action shall be carefully checked until the other vessel is finally passed and clear. E. If necessary to avoid collision or allow more to assess the situation, a vessel shall slacken her speed or take all way off by stopping or reversing her means of propulsion. F. 1. A vessel which, by any of these rules, is required not to impede the passage or safe passage of another vessel shall, when required by the circumstances of the case, take early action to allow sufficient sea room for the safe passage of the other vessel. 2. A vessel required not to impede the passage or safe passage of another vessel is not relieved of this obligation if approaching the other vessel so as to involve risk of collision and shall, when taking action, have full regard to the action which may be required by the rules of this part. 3. A vessel the passage of which is not to be impeded remains fully obliged to comply with the rules of this part when the two vessels are approaching one another so as to involve risk of collision. Rule 9. Narrow Channels. A. A vessel proceeding along the course of a narrow channel or fairway shall keep as near to the outer limit of the channel or fairway which lies on her starboard side as is safe and practicable. 
b a vessel of less than 20 meters in length or a sailing vessel shall not impede the passage of a vessel which can safely navigate only within a narrow channel or fairway c a vessel engaged in fishing shall not impede the passage of any other vessel navigating within a narrow channel or fairway D. A vessel shall not cross a narrow channel or fairway if such crossing impedes the passage of a vessel which can safely navigate only within such channel or fairway. The latter vessel may use the sound signal prescribed in Rule 34, D, if in doubt as to the intention of the crossing vessel. E. 1. In a narrow channel or fairway when overtaking can take place only if the vessel to be overtaken has to take action to permit safe passing, the vessel intending to overtake shall indicate her intention by sounding the appropriate signal prescribed in Rule 34. C. 1. The vessel to be overtaken shall, if in agreement, sound the appropriate signal prescribed in Rule 34. C. 2. And take steps to permit safe passing. If in doubt, she may sound the signals prescribed in Rule 34, d. 2. This rule does not relieve the overtaking vessel of her obligation under Rule 13. f. A vessel nearing a bend or an area of a narrow channel or fairway where other vessels may be obscured by an intervening obstruction shall navigate with particular alertness and caution and shall sound the appropriate signal prescribed in Rule 34, e. g. Any vessel shall, if the circumstances of the case admit, avoid anchoring in a narrow channel. Rule 10. Traffic Separation Schemes. A. This rule applies to traffic separation schemes adopted by the organization and does not relieve any vessel of her obligation under any other rule. B. A vessel using a traffic separation scheme shall 1. Proceed in the appropriate traffic lane in the general direction of traffic flow for that lane. 2. So far as practicable keep clear of a traffic separation line or separation zone. 3. Normally join or leave a traffic lane at the termination of the lane, but when joining or leaving from either side shall do so at as small an angle to the general direction of traffic flow as practicable. C. A vessel shall so far as practicable avoid crossing traffic lanes, but if obliged to do so shall cross on a heading as nearly as practicable at right angles to the general direction of traffic flow. D. 1. A vessel shall not use an inshore traffic zone when she can safely use the appropriate traffic lane within the adjacent traffic separation scheme. However, vessels of less than 20 meters in length, sailing vessels, and vessels engaged in fishing may use the inshore traffic zone. 2. Notwithstanding subparagraph, d. 1. A vessel may use an inshore traffic zone when en route to or from a port, offshore installation or structure, pilot station or any other place situated within the inshore traffic zone, or to avoid immediate danger. E. A vessel, other than a crossing vessel, or a vessel joining or leaving a lane shall not normally enter a separation zone or cross a separation line except 1. In cases of emergency, to avoid immediate danger. 2. To engage in fishing within a separation zone. F. A vessel navigating in areas near the terminations of traffic separation schemes shall do so with particular caution. G. A vessel shall so far as practicable avoid anchoring in a traffic separation scheme or in areas near its terminations. H. A vessel not using a traffic separation scheme shall avoid it by as wide a margin as is practicable. I. A vessel engaged in fishing shall not impede the passage of any vessel following a traffic lane. J. A vessel of less than 20 meters in length or a sailing vessel shall not impede the safe passage of a power-driven vessel following a traffic lane. K. A vessel restricted in her ability to maneuver when engaged in an operation for the maintenance of safety of navigation in a traffic separation scheme is exempted from complying with this rule to the extent necessary to carry out the operation.
L. A vessel restricted in her ability to maneuver when engaged in an operation for the laying, servicing, or picking up of a submarine cable, within a traffic separation scheme, is exempted from complying with this rule, to the extent necessary, to carry out the operation. Section 2. Conduct of vessels in sight of one another. Rule 11. Application. Rules in this section apply to vessels in sight of one another. Rule 12. Sailing vessels. A. When two sailing vessels are approaching one another, so as to involve risk of collision, one of them shall keep out of the way of the other as follows. 1. When each has the wind on a different side, the vessel which has the wind on the port side shall keep out of the way of the other. 2. When both have the wind on the same side, the vessel which is to windward shall keep out of the way of the vessel which is to leeward. 3. If a vessel with the wind on the port side sees a vessel to windward and cannot determine with certainty whether the other vessel has the wind on the port or on the starboard side, she shall keep out of the way of the other. b. For the purposes of this rule, the windward side shall be deemed to be the side opposite to that on which the mainsail is carried or, in the case of a square-rigged vessel, the side opposite to that on which the largest fore and aft sail is carried. Rule 13. Overtaking. A. Notwithstanding anything contained in the rules of Part B, Sections 1 and 2, any vessel overtaking any other shall keep out of the way of the vessel being overtaken. B. A vessel shall be deemed to be overtaking when coming up with another vessel from a direction more than 22.5 degrees abaft her beam, that is, in such a position with reference to the vessel she is overtaking, that at night, she would be able to see only the stern light of that vessel, but neither of her side lights. C. When a vessel is in any doubt as to whether she is overtaking another, she shall assume that this is the case and act accordingly. D. Any subsequent alteration of the bearing between the two vessels shall not make the overtaking vessel a crossing vessel within the meaning of these rules or relieve her of the duty of keeping clear of the overtaken vessel until she is finally passed and clear. Rule 14. Head-on situation. A. When two power-driven vessels are meeting on reciprocal or nearly reciprocal courses so as to involve risk of collision each shall alter her course to starboard so that each shall pass on the port side of the other. B. Such a situation shall be deemed to exist when a vessel sees the other ahead or nearly ahead and by night she could see the masthead lights of the other in a line or nearly in a line and or both side lights and by day she observes the corresponding aspect of the other vessel. C. When a vessel is in any doubt as to whether such a situation exists, she shall assume that it does exist and act accordingly. Rule 15. Crossing Situation. When two power-driven vessels are crossing so as to involve risk of collision, the vessel which has the other on her own starboard side shall keep out of the way and shall, if the circumstances of the case admit, avoid crossing ahead of the other vessel. Rule 16. Action by Giveaway Vessel. Every vessel which is directed to keep out of the way of another vessel shall, so far as possible, take early and substantial action to keep well clear. Rule 17. Action by stand-on vessel. A. 1. Where one of two vessels is to keep out of the way the other shall keep her course and speed. 2. The latter vessel may however take action to avoid collision by her maneuver alone, as soon as it becomes apparent to her that the vessel required to keep out of the way is not taking appropriate action in compliance with these rules. B. 
be when, from any cause, the vessel required to keep her course and speed finds herself so close that collision cannot be avoided by the action of the giveaway vessel alone, she shall take such action as will best aid to avoid collision. C. A power-driven vessel which takes action in a crossing situation in accordance with subparagraph A. 2. Of this rule, to avoid collision with another power-driven vessel shall, if the circumstances of the case admit, not alter course to port for a vessel on her own port side. D. This rule does not relieve the giveaway vessel of her obligation to keep out of the way. Rule 18. Responsibilities between vessels. Except where Rules 9, 10, and 13 otherwise require, a. A power-driven vessel underway shall keep out of the way of. 1. A vessel not under command. 2. A vessel restricted in her ability to maneuver. 3. A vessel engaged in fishing. 4. A sailing vessel. b. A sailing vessel underway shall keep out of the way of. 1. A vessel not under command. 2. A vessel restricted in her ability to maneuver. 3. A vessel engaged in fishing. c. A vessel engaged in fishing when underway shall, so far as possible, keep out of the way of. 1. A vessel not under command. 2. A vessel restricted in her ability to maneuver. D. 1. Any vessel other than a vessel not under command or a vessel restricted in her ability to maneuver shall, if the circumstances of the case admit, avoid impeding the safe passage of a vessel, constrained by her draft, exhibiting the signals in Rule 28. 2. A vessel constrained by her draft shall navigate with particular caution, having full regard to her special condition. e. A seaplane on the water shall, in general, keep well clear of all vessels and avoid impeding their navigation. In circumstances, however, where risk of collision exists, she shall comply with the rules of this part. f. 1. A wig craft shall, when taking off, landing and in flight near the surface, Keep well clear of all other vessels and avoid impeding their navigation. 2. A wig craft operating on the water surface shall comply with the rules of this part as a power-driven vessel. Section 3. Conduct of vessels in restricted visibility. Rule 19. Conduct of vessels in restricted visibility. A. This rule applies to vessels not in sight of one another when navigating in or near an area of restricted visibility. B. Every vessel shall proceed at a safe speed adapted to the prevailing circumstances and conditions of restricted visibility. A power-driven vessel shall have engines ready for immediate maneuver. C. Every vessel shall have due regard to the prevailing circumstances and conditions of restricted visibility when complying with the rules of Section 1 of this part. D. A vessel which detects, by radar alone, the presence of another vessel shall determine if a close quarters situation is developing and a risk of collision exists. If so, she shall take avoiding action in ample time, provided that when such action consists of an alteration of course, so far as possible the following shall be avoided. 1. An alteration of course to port for a vessel forward of the beam, other than for a vessel being overtaken. 2. An alteration of course towards a vessel abeam or abaft the beam. e. Except where it has been determined that a risk of collision does not exist, every vessel which hears apparently forward of her beam the fog signal of another vessel, or which cannot avoid a close quarters situation with another vessel forward of her beam, shall reduce her speed to the minimum at which she can be kept on her course. 
She shall if necessary, take all her way off and in any event navigate with extreme caution until danger of collision is over. International Regulations for Preventing Collisions at Sea Part C – Lights and Shapes Rule 20 Application A. Rules in this part shall be complied with in all weathers. B. The rules concerning lights shall be complied with from sunset to sunrise, and during such times no other lights shall be exhibited, except such lights as cannot be mistaken for the lights specified in these rules or do not impair their visibility or distinctive character, or interfere with the keeping of a proper lookout. C. The lights prescribed by these rules shall, if carried, also be exhibited from sunrise to sunset in restricted visibility and may be exhibited in all other circumstances when it is deemed necessary. D. The rules concerning shapes shall be complied with by day. E. The lights and shapes specified in these rules shall comply with the provisions of Annex 1 to these regulations. Rule 21. Definitions A. Masthead light means a white light placed over the fore and aft centerline of the vessel, showing an unbroken light over an arc of the horizon of 225 degrees, and so fixed as to show the light from right ahead to 22.5 degrees abaft the beam on either side of the vessel. B. Side lights means a green light on the starboard side and a red light on the port side each showing an unbroken light over an arc of the horizon of 112.5 degrees and so fixed as to show the light from right ahead to 22.5 degrees abaft the beam on its respective side. In a vessel of less than 20 meters in length, the side lights may be combined in one lantern carried on the fore and aft centerline of the vessel. C. Stern light means a white light placed as nearly as practicable at the stern showing an unbroken light over an arc of the horizon of 135 degrees, and so fixed as to show the light 67.5 degrees from right aft on each side of the vessel. D. Towing light means a yellow light having the same characteristics as the stern light defined in paragraph C of this rule. E. All-round light means a light showing an unbroken light over an arc of the horizon of 360 degrees. F. Flashing light means a light flashing at regular intervals at a frequency of 120 flashes or more per minute. Rule 22. Visibility of lights. The lights prescribed in these rules shall have an intensity as specified in Section 8 Annex 1 to these regulations so as to be visible at the following minimum ranges. A. In vessels of 50 meters or more in length, a masthead light, 6 miles, a side light, 3 miles, a stern light, 3 miles, a towing light, 3 miles, a white, red, green, or yellow all-round light, 3 miles b. In vessels of 12 meters or more in length, but less than 50 meters in length, a masthead light, 5 miles, except that where the length of the vessel is less than 20 meters, 3 miles, a side light, 2 miles, a stern light, 2 miles, a towing light, 2 miles, a white, red, green, or yellow all-round light, 2 miles. C. In vessels of less than 12 meters in length, a masthead light, 2 miles, a side light, 1 mile, a stern light, 2 miles, a towing light, 2 miles, a white, red, green, or yellow all-round light, 2 miles. D. In inconspicuous, partly submerged vessels or objects being towed, a white all-round light, 3 miles. Rule 23.
power-driven vessels underway. A. A power-driven vessel underway shall exhibit 1. A masthead light forward 2. A second masthead light abaft of and higher than the forward one except that a vessel of less than 50 meters in length shall not be obliged to exhibit such light, but may do so. 3. Side lights. 4. A stern light. b. An air cushion vessel, when operating in the non-displacement mode shall, in addition to the lights prescribed in paragraph a, of this rule exhibit an all-round flashing yellow light. c. A wig craft only when taking off landing and in flight near the surface shall, in addition to the lights prescribed in paragraph A of this rule, exhibit a high-intensity all-round flashing red light. D. 1. A power-driven vessel of less than 12 meters in length may in lieu of the lights prescribed in paragraph A of this rule exhibit an all-round white light and side lights, 2. A power-driven vessel of less than 7 meters in length whose maximum speed does not exceed 7 knots may in lieu of the lights prescribed in paragraph A of this rule exhibit an all-round white light and shall, if practicable, also exhibit side lights. 3. The masthead light or all-round white light on a power-driven vessel of less than 12 meters in length may be displaced from the fore and aft centerline of the vessel if centerline fitting is not practicable. Provided that the side lights are combined in one lantern which shall be carried on the fore and aft centerline of the vessel or located as nearly as practicable in the same fore and aft line as the masthead light or the all-round white light. Rule 24. Towing and Pushing. A. A power-driven vessel when towing shall exhibit. 1. Instead of the light prescribed in Rule 23, A. 1. Or. A. 2. Two masthead lights in a vertical line. When the length of the tow, measuring from the stern of the towing vessel to the after end of the tow exceeds 200 meters, three such lights in a vertical line, two side lights, three a stern light, four a towing light in a vertical line above the stern light, five when the length of the tow exceeds 200 meters, a diamond shape where it can best be seen. B. When a pushing vessel and a vessel being pushed ahead are rigidly connected in a composite unit, they shall be regarded as a power-driven vessel and exhibit the lights prescribed in Rule 23. C. A power-driven vessel when pushing ahead or towing alongside, except in the case of a composite unit, shall exhibit 1. Instead of the light prescribed in Rule 23, A. 1. Or. A. 2. Two masthead lights in a vertical line. 2. Side lights. 3. A stern light. d. A power-driven vessel to which paragraph a or c of this rule applies shall also comply with rule 23 a. 2. e. A vessel or object being towed, other than those mentioned in paragraph g of this rule, shall exhibit 1. Side lights. 2. A stern light. 3. When the length of the tow exceeds 200 meters, a diamond shape where it can best be seen. F. Provided that any number of vessels being towed alongside or pushed in a group shall be lighted as one vessel. 1. A vessel being pushed ahead, not being part of a composite unit, shall exhibit at the forward end, side lights. 2. A vessel being towed alongside shall exhibit a stern light and at the forward end, side lights. G. An inconspicuous, partly submerged vessel or object, or combination of such vessels or objects being towed, shall exhibit 1. If it is less than 25 meters in breadth, one all-round white light at or near the forward end and one at or near the after end except that drakens need not exhibit a light at or near the forward end. 2. If it is 25 meters or more in breadth, two additional all-round white lights at or near the extremities of its breadth. 3 if it exceeds 100 meters in length. Additional all-round white lights between the lights prescribed in subparagraphs 1 and 2, so that the distance between the lights shall not exceed 100 meters. 4. A diamond shape at or near the aftermost extremity of the last vessel or object being towed and if the length of the tow exceeds 200 meters an additional diamond shape where it can best be seen and located as far forward as is practicable.
H. Where from any sufficient cause it is impracticable for a vessel or object being towed to exhibit the lights or shapes prescribed in paragraph E or G of this rule, all possible measures shall be taken to light the vessel or object towed or at least to indicate the presence of such vessel or object. 1. Where from any sufficient cause it is impracticable for a vessel not normally engaged in towing operations to display the lights prescribed in paragraph A or C of this rule, such vessel shall not be required to exhibit those lights when engaged in towing another vessel in distress or otherwise in need of assistance. All possible measures shall be taken to indicate the nature of the relationship between the towing vessel and the vessel being towed as authorized by Rule 36, in particular, by illuminating the tow line. Rule 25. Sailing vessels underway and vessels under oars. A. A sailing vessel underway shall exhibit. 1. Side lights. 2. A stern light. B. In a sailing vessel of less than 20 meters in length, the lights prescribed in paragraph A of this rule may be combined in one lantern carried at or near the top of the mast where it can best be seen. C. A sailing vessel underway may, in addition to the lights prescribed in paragraph A of this rule, exhibit at or near the top of the mast, where they can best be seen, two all-round lights in a vertical line, the upper being red and the lower green, but these lights shall not be exhibited in conjunction with the combined lantern permitted by paragraph B of this rule. D. 1. A sailing vessel of less than 7 meters in length shall, if practicable, exhibit the lights prescribed in paragraph A or B of this rule, but if she does not, she shall have ready at hand an electric torch or lighted lantern showing a white light which shall be exhibited in sufficient time to prevent collision. 2. A vessel under oars may exhibit the lights prescribed in this rule for sailing vessels, but if she does not, she shall have ready at hand an electric torch or lighted lantern showing a white light which shall be exhibited in sufficient time to prevent collision. E. A vessel proceeding under sail, when also being propelled by machinery, shall exhibit forward where it can best be seen a conical shape, apex downwards. Rule 26. Fishing Vessels. A. A vessel engaged in fishing, whether underway or at anchor, shall exhibit only the lights and shapes prescribed in this rule. B. A vessel, when engaged in trawling, by which is meant the dragging through the water of a dredge net or other apparatus used as a fishing appliance, shall exhibit 1. Two all-round lights in a vertical line, the upper being green and the lower white or a shape consisting of two cones with their apexes together in a vertical line one above the other. 2. A masthead light abaft of and higher than the all-round green light, a vessel of less than 50 meters in length shall not be obliged to exhibit such a light but may do so. 3. When making way through the water, in addition to the lights prescribed in this paragraph, side lights and a stern light. C. A vessel engaged in fishing, other than trawling, shall exhibit 1. Two all-round lights in a vertical line, the upper being red and the lower white, or a shape consisting of two cones with apexes together in a vertical line one above the other. 2. When there is outlying gear extending more than 150 meters horizontally from the vessel, an all-round white light or a cone apex upwards in the direction of the gear, 3. When making way through the water, in addition to the lights prescribed. In this paragraph, side lights and a stern light. D. The additional signals described in Annex 2 to these regulations apply to a vessel engaged in fishing in close proximity to other vessels engaged in fishing. E. A vessel when not engaged in fishing shall not exhibit the lights or shapes prescribed in this rule, but only those prescribed for a vessel of her length. Rule 27. Vessels not under command or restricted in their ability to maneuver. A. A vessel not under command shall exhibit 1. Two all-round red lights in a vertical line where they can best be seen. 2. Two balls or similar shapes in a vertical line where they can best be seen. 3. When making way through the water, 
in addition to the lights prescribed in this paragraph, side lights, and a stern light. b. A vessel restricted in her ability to maneuver, except a vessel engaged in mine clearance operations, shall exhibit 1. Three all-round lights in a vertical line where they can best be seen. The highest and lowest of these lights shall be red and the middle light shall be white. 2. Three shapes in a vertical line where they can best be seen. The highest and lowest of these shapes shall be balls and the middle one a diamond. 3. When making way through the water, a masthead light or lights, side lights, and a stern light in addition to the lights prescribed in subparagraph. 1. 4. When at anchor, in addition to the lights or shapes prescribed in subparagraphs, 1, and 2, the light, lights or shape prescribed in Rule 30. c. A power-driven vessel engaged in a towing operation such as severely restricts the towing vessel and her tow in their ability to deviate from their course shall, in addition to the lights or shapes prescribed in Rule 24, a. Exhibit the lights or shapes prescribed in subparagraphs, b. 1, and 2, of this rule. D. A vessel engaged in dredging or underwater operations, when restricted in her ability to maneuver, shall exhibit the lights and shapes prescribed in subparagraphs B, 1, 2, and 3 of this rule and shall in addition, when an obstruction exists, exhibit 1. Two all-round red lights or two balls in a vertical line to indicate the side on which the obstruction exists. 2. Two all-round green lights or two diamonds in a vertical line to indicate the side on which another vessel may pass. 3. When at anchor, the lights or shapes prescribed in this paragraph instead of the lights or shape prescribed in Rule 30. e. Whenever the size of a vessel engaged in diving operations makes it impracticable to exhibit all lights and shapes prescribed in paragraph d. of this rule, the following shall be exhibited, 1. Three all-round lights in a vertical line where they can best be seen. The highest and lowest of these lights shall be red and the middle light shall be white. 2. A rigid replica of the International Code Flag Alpha not less than 1 meter in height. Measures shall be taken to ensure its all-round visibility. f. A vessel engaged in mine clearance operations shall in addition to the lights prescribed for a power-driven vessel in Rule 23 or to the lights or shape prescribed for a vessel at anchor in Rule 30 as appropriate, exhibit three all-round green lights or three balls. One of these lights or shapes shall be exhibited near the foremast head and one at each end of the foreyard. These lights or shapes indicate that it is dangerous for another vessel to approach within 1,000 meters of the mine clearance vessel. g. Vessels of less than 12 meters in length, except those engaged in diving operations, shall not be required to exhibit the lights and shapes prescribed in this rule. h. The signals prescribed in this rule are not signals of vessels in distress and requiring assistance. Such signals are contained in Annex 4 to these regulations. Rule 28. Vessel constrained by their draft. A vessel constrained by her draft may, in addition to the lights prescribed for power-driven vessels in Rule 23, exhibit where they can best be seen three all-round red lights in a vertical line or a cylinder. Rule 29. Pilot Vessels A. A vessel engaged on pilotage duty shall exhibit 1. At or near the masthead, 2. All-round lights in a vertical line, the upper being white and the lower red, 2. When underway, in addition, side light and a stern light, 3. When at anchor, in addition to the lights prescribed in subparagraph, 1. The light, lights or shape prescribed in Rule 30 for vessels at anchor. B. A pilot vessel when not engaged on pilotage duty shall exhibit the lights or shapes prescribed for a similar vessel of her length. Rule 30. Anchored Vessels and Vessels Aground. A. A vessel at anchor shall exhibit where it can best be seen, 1. In the fore part, an all-round white light or one ball. 2. At or near the stern and at a lower level than the light prescribed in subparagraph, 1. An all-round white light. 
B, a vessel of less than 50 meters in length, may exhibit an all-round white light where it can best be seen instead of the lights prescribed in paragraph A of this rule. C, a vessel at anchor may, and a vessel of 100 meters and more in length shall, also use the available working or equivalent lights to illuminate her decks. D, a vessel aground shall exhibit the lights prescribed in paragraph A or B of this rule and in addition, where they can best be seen, 1, 2 all-round red lights in a vertical line, 2, 3 balls in a vertical line, E, a vessel of less than 7 meters in length, when at anchor, not in or near a narrow channel, fairway, or anchorage, or where other vessels normally navigate, shall not be required to exhibit the lights or shape prescribed in paragraphs A, B, of this rule. F, a vessel of less than 12 meters in length, when aground, shall not be required to exhibit the lights or shapes prescribed in subparagraphs D, 1, and 2 of this rule. Rule 31. Seaplanes. Where it is impracticable for a seaplane or a wing and ground craft to exhibit lights and shapes of the characteristics or in the positions prescribed in the rules of this part, she shall exhibit lights and shapes as closely similar in characteristics and position as is possible. International Regulations for Preventing Collisions at Sea Part D Sound and Light Signals Rule 32 Definitions A. The word whistle means any sound signaling appliance capable of producing the prescribed blasts and which complies with the specifications in Annex 3 to these regulations. B. The term short blast means a blast of about one second's duration. C. The term prolonged blast means a blast of from four to six seconds is duration. Rule 33. Equipment for sound signals. A. A vessel of 12 meters or more in length shall be provided with a whistle. A vessel of 20 meters or more in length shall be provided with a bell in addition to a whistle. And a vessel of 100 meters or more in length shall, in addition, be provided with a gong, the tone and sound of which cannot be confused with that of the bell. The whistle, bell and gong shall comply with the specification in Annex 3 to these regulations. The bell or gong or both may be replaced by other equipment having the same respective sound characteristics, provided that manual sounding of the required signals shall always be possible. B. A vessel of less than 12 meters in length shall not be obliged to carry the sound signaling appliances prescribed in paragraph A of this rule, but if she does not, she shall be provided with some other means of making an efficient sound signal. Rule 34. Maneuvering and Warning Signals. A. When vessels are in sight of one another, a power-driven vessel underway, when maneuvering is authorized or required by these rules, shall indicate that maneuver by the following signals on her whistle, one short blast to mean I am altering my course to starboard, two short blasts to mean I am altering my course to port, three short blasts to mean I am operating a stern propulsion. B. Any vessel may supplement the whistle signals prescribed in paragraph A of this rule by light signals, repeated as appropriate, whilst the maneuver is being carried out, 
1. These light signals shall have the following significance. 1. Flash, to mean I am altering my course to starboard. 2. Flashes to mean I am altering my course to port. 3. Flashes to mean I am operating a stern propulsion. Two, the duration of each flash shall be about one second, the interval between flashes shall be about one second, and the interval between successive signals shall be not less than 10 seconds. Three, the light used for this signal shall, if fitted, be an all-round white light, visible at a minimum range of five miles, and shall comply with the provisions of Annex 1 to these regulations. C. When in sight of one another in a narrow channel or fairway, 1. A vessel intending to overtake another shall in compliance with Rule 9, e. 1. Indicate her intention by the following signals on her whistle. 2. Prolonged blasts, followed by one short blast, to mean I intend to overtake you on your starboard side. 2. Prolonged blasts, followed by two short blasts, to mean I intend to overtake you on your port side. Two, the vessel about to be overtaken when acting in accordance with Rule 9, E, 1, shall indicate her agreement by the following signal on her whistle, one prolonged, one short, one prolonged and one short blast, in that order. D. When vessels in sight of one another are approaching each other and from any cause either vessel fails to understand the intentions or actions of the other, or is in doubt whether sufficient action is being taken by the other to avoid collision, the vessel in doubt shall immediately indicate such doubt by giving at least five short and rapid blasts on the whistle. Such signal may be supplemented by a light signal of at least five short and rapid flashes. E. A vessel nearing a bend or an area of a channel or fairway where other vessels may be obscured by an intervening obstruction shall sound one prolonged blast. Such signal shall be answered with a prolonged blast by any approaching vessel that may be within hearing around the bend or behind the intervening obstruction. F. If whistles are fitted on a vessel at a distance apart of more than 100 meters, one whistle only shall be used for giving maneuvering and warning signals. Rule 35. Sound signals in restricted visibility. In or near an area of restricted visibility, whether by day or night, the signals prescribed in this rule shall be used as follows. A. A power-driven vessel making way through the water shall sound at intervals of not more than two minutes one prolonged blast. B. A power-driven vessel underway but stopped and making no way through the water shall sound at intervals of not more than two minutes two prolonged blasts in succession with an interval of about two seconds between them. C. A vessel not under command, a vessel restricted in her ability to maneuver, a vessel constrained by her draft, a sailing vessel, a vessel engaged in fishing and a vessel engaged in towing or pushing another vessel shall, instead of the signals prescribed in paragraphs, A, or, B, of this rule sound at intervals of not more than two minutes three blasts in succession, namely one prolonged followed by two short blasts. D. A vessel engaged in fishing, when at anchor, and a vessel restricted in her ability to maneuver when carrying out her work at anchor, shall instead of the signals prescribed in paragraph, G, of this rule, sound the signal prescribed in paragraph, C, of this rule. E. A vessel towed or if more than one vessel is towed the last vessel of the tow, if manned, shall at intervals of not more than two minutes sound four blasts in succession, namely one prolonged followed by three short blasts. When practicable, this signal shall be made immediately after the signal made by the towing vessel.
F. When a pushing vessel and a vessel being pushed ahead are rigidly connected in a composite unit, they shall be regarded as a power-driven vessel and shall give the signals prescribed in paragraphs A or B of this rule. G. A vessel at anchor shall at intervals of not more than one minute ring the bell rapidly for about five seconds. In a vessel of 100 meters or more in length, the bell shall be sounded in the forepart of the vessel and immediately after the ringing of the bell, the gong shall be sounded rapidly for about five seconds in the after part of the vessel. A vessel at anchor may in addition sound three blasts in succession, namely one short, one prolonged and one short blast, to give warning of her position and of the possibility of collision to an approaching vessel. H. A vessel aground shall give the bell signal and if required the gong signal prescribed in paragraph G of this rule and shall, in addition, give three separate and distinct strokes on the bell immediately before and after the rapid ringing of the bell. A vessel aground may in addition sound an appropriate whistle signal. I, a vessel of 12 meters or more but less than 20 meters in length, shall not be obliged to give the bell signals prescribed in paragraphs G and H of this rule. However, if she does not, she shall make some other efficient sound signal at intervals of not more than 2 minutes. J, a vessel of less than 12 meters in length, shall not be obliged to give the above-mentioned signals, but, if she does not, shall make some other efficient sound signal at intervals of not more than two minutes. K. A pilot vessel when engaged on pilotage duty may in addition to the signals prescribed in paragraphs A, B, or G of this rule sound an identity signal consisting of four short blasts. Rule 36. Signals to attract attention. If necessary to attract the attention of another vessel, any vessel may make light or sound signals that cannot be mistaken for any signal authorized elsewhere in these rules, or may direct the beam of her searchlight in the direction of the danger, in such a way as not to embarrass any vessel. Any light to attract the attention of another vessel shall be such that it cannot be mistaken for any aid to navigation. For the purpose of this rule, the use of high-intensity intermittent or revolving lights, such as strobe lights, shall be avoided. Rule 37. Distress Signals. When a vessel is in distress and requires assistance, she shall use or exhibit the signals described in Annex 4 to these regulations. International Regulations for Preventing Collisions at Sea Part E – Exemptions Rule 38 Exemptions Any vessel, or class of vessels, provided that she complies with the requirements of the International Regulations for Preventing Collisions at Sea, 1960, the keel of which is laid or which is at a corresponding stage of construction before the entry into force of these regulations may be exempted from compliance therewith as follows. a. The installation of lights with ranges prescribed in Rule 22 until four years after the date of entry into force of these regulations. b. The installation of lights with color specifications as prescribed in Section 7 of Annex 1 to these regulations until four years after the date of entry into force of these regulations. c. The repositioning of lights as a result of conversion from imperial to metric units and rounding off measurement figures, permanent exemption. 
D. 1. The repositioning of masthead lights on vessels of less than 150 meters in length, resulting from the prescriptions of Section 3. A. Of Annex 1 to these regulations, permanent exemption. 2. The repositioning of masthead lights on vessels of 150 meters or more in length, resulting from the prescriptions of Section 3. A. Of Annex 1 to these regulations, until 9 years after the date of entry into force of these regulations. E. The repositioning of masthead lights resulting from the prescriptions of Section 2. B. Of Annex 1 to these regulations, until 9 years after the date of entry into force of these regulations. F. The repositioning of side lights resulting from the prescriptions of sections 2, G, and 3, B, of Annex 1 to these regulations, until 9 years after the date of entry into force of these regulations. G. The requirements for sound signal appliances prescribed in Annex 3 to these regulations, until 9 years after the date of entry into force of these regulations. H. The repositioning of all-round lights resulting from the prescription of Section 9, B, of Annex 1 to these regulations, permanent exemption. Part F. Verification of compliance with the provisions of the Convention. Rule 39. Definitions. A. Audit means a systematic, independent, and documented process for obtaining audit evidence and evaluating it objectively to determine the extent to which audit criteria are fulfilled. B. Audit scheme means the IMO member state audit scheme established by the organization and taking into account the guidelines developed by the organization. Refer to the framework and procedures for the IMO member state audit scheme adopted by the organization by Resolution A.1067, 28. C. Code for implementation means the IMO instrument's implementation code adopted by the organization by Resolution A.1070, 28. D. Audit standard means the code for implementation. Rule 40. Application. Contracting parties shall use the provisions of the Code for Implementation in the execution of their obligations and responsibilities contained in the present Convention. Rule 41. Verification of Compliance. A. Every contracting party shall be subject to periodic audits by the organization in accordance with the audit standard to verify compliance with and implementation of the present convention. B. The Secretary General of the organization shall have responsibility for administering the audit scheme, based on the guidelines developed by the organization. C. Every contracting party shall have responsibility for facilitating the conduct of the audit and implementation of a program of actions to address the findings, based on the guidelines developed by the organization. D. Audit of all contracting parties shall be, 1. Based on an overall schedule developed by the Secretary General of the organization, taking into account the guidelines developed by the organization, and, 2. Conducted at periodic intervals, taking into account the guidelines developed by the organization. Refer to the framework and procedures for the IMO member state audit scheme adopted by the organization by Resolution A.1067, 28.
International Regulations for Preventing Collisions at Sea Annex 1 Positioning and Technical Details of Lights and Shapes One definition. The term height above the hull means height above the uppermost continuous deck. This height shall be measured from the position vertically beneath the location of the light. Two, vertical positioning and spacing of lights. A. On a power-driven vessel of 20 meters or more in length, the masthead lights shall be placed as follows. 1. The forward masthead light, or if only one masthead light is carried, then that light, at a height above the hull of not less than 6 meters, and, if the breadth of the vessel exceeds 6 meters, then at a height above the hull not less than such breadth, so however, that the light need not be placed at a greater height above the hull than 12 meters. Two, when two masthead lights are carried, the after one shall be at least 4.5 meters vertically higher than the forward one. B. The vertical separation of mast headlights of power-driven vessels shall be such that in all normal conditions of trim the after light will be seen over and separate from the forward light at a distance of 1,000 meters from the stem when viewed from sea level. C. The masthead light of a power-driven vessel of 12 meters, but less than 20 meters in length, shall be placed at a height above the gunwale of not less than 2.5 meters. D. A power-driven vessel of less than 12 meters in length may carry the uppermost light at a height of less than 2.5 meters above the gunwale. When however a masthead light is carried in addition to side lights and a stern light or the all-round light prescribed in Rule 23, C. 1. is carried in addition to side lights, then such masthead light or all-round light shall be carried at least 1 meter higher than the side lights. E. One of the two or three masthead lights prescribed for a power-driven vessel when engaged in towing or pushing another vessel shall be placed in the same position as either the forward masthead light or the after masthead light, provided that, if carried on the aftermast, the lowest after masthead light shall be at least 4.5 meters vertically higher than the forward masthead light. F. 1. The masthead lights prescribed in Rule 23, A. Shall be so placed as to be above and clear of all other lights and obstructions except as described in subparagraph 2. 2. When it is impracticable to carry the all-round lights prescribed by Rule 27, B. 1. Or Rule 28 below the masthead lights, they may be carried above the after masthead lights or vertically in between the forward masthead lights and after masthead lights, provided that in the latter case the requirement of Section 3, C, of this annex shall be complied with. G. The side lights of a power driven vessel shall be placed at a height above the hull not greater than three quarters of that of the forward masthead light. They shall not be so low as to be interfered with by deck lights. H. The side lights, if in a combined lantern and carried on a power-driven vessel of less than 20 meters in length, shall be placed not less than 1 meter below the masthead light.
I. When the rules prescribe two or three lights to be carried in a vertical line, they shall be spaced as follows. 1. On a vessel of 20 meters in length or more such lights shall be spaced not less than 2 meters apart, and the lowest of these lights shall, except where a towing light is required, be placed at a height of not less than 4 meters above the hull. Two, on a vessel of less than 20 meters in length such lights shall be spaced not less than one meter apart and the lowest of these lights shall, except where a towing light is required, be placed at a height of not less than two meters above the gunnel. Three, when three lights are carried they shall be equally spaced. J. The lower of the two all-round lights prescribed for a vessel when engaged in fishing shall be at a height above the side lights not less than twice the distance between the two vertical lights. K. The forward anchor light prescribed in Rule 30, A. 1. When two are carried, shall not be less than 4.5 meters above the after one. On a vessel of 50 meters or more in length, this forward anchor light shall be placed at a height of not less than 6 meters above the hull. Three, horizontal positioning and spacing of lights. A, when two masthead lights are prescribed for a power-driven vessel, the horizontal distance between them shall not be less than one half of the length of the vessel, but need not be more than 100 meters. The forward light shall be placed not more than one quarter of the length of the vessel from the stem. B. On a power-driven vessel of 20 meters or more in length, the side lights shall not be placed in front of the forward masthead lights. They shall be placed at or near the side of the vessel. The term near the side is interpreted as being a distance of not more than 10% of the breadth of the vessel inboard from the side, up to a maximum of 1 meter. Where the application of above requirement is impractical, example, small ships with superstructure of reduced width, exemption may be given on the basis of the flag authority acceptance. C. When the lights prescribed in Rule 27, B, 1, or Rule 28 are placed vertically between the forward masthead lights and the after masthead lights these all-round lights shall be placed at a horizontal distance of not less than 2 meters from the fore and after centerline of the vessel in the athwartship direction. D. When only one masthead light is prescribed for a power-driven vessel, this light shall be exhibited forward of amidships, except that a vessel of less than 20 meters in length need not exhibit this light forward of amidships, but shall exhibit it as far forward as is practicable. Four, details of location of direction indicating lights for fishing vessels, dredgers, and vessels engaged in underwater operations. A. The light indicating the direction of the outlying gear from a vessel engaged in fishing as prescribed in Rule 26, C. 2. Shall be placed at a horizontal distance of not less than 2 meters and not more than 6 meters away from the two all-round red and white lights. This light shall be placed not higher than the all-round white light prescribed in Rule 26, C, 1, and not lower than the side lights. B, the lights and shapes on a vessel engaged in dredging or underwater operations to indicate the obstructed side and or the side on which it is safe to pass, as prescribed in Rule 27, D, 1, and 2, shall be placed at the maximum practical horizontal distance, but in no case less than 2 meters, 
from the lights or shapes prescribed in Rule 27, B, 1, and 2. In no case shall the upper of these lights or shapes be at a greater height than the lower of the three lights or shapes prescribed in Rule 27, B, 1, and 2. 5. Screens for side lights. The side lights of vessels of 20 meters or more in length shall be fitted with inboard screens painted matte black and meeting the requirements of Section 9 of this NX. On vessels of less than 20 meters in length the side lights, if necessary to meet the requirements of Section 9 of this NX, shall be fitted with inboard matte black screens. With a combined lantern, using a single vertical filament and a very narrow division between the green and red sections, external screens need not be fitted. 6. Shapes a. Shapes shall be black and of the following sizes. 1. A ball shall have a diameter of not less than 0.6 meter. 2. A cone shall have a base diameter of not less than 0.6 meter and a height equal to its diameter. 3. A cylinder shall have a diameter of at least 0.6 meter and a height of twice its diameter. 4. A diamond shape shall consist of two cones as defined in 2. Above having a common base. b. The vertical distance between shapes shall be at least 1.5 meters. c. In a vessel of less than 20 meters in length shapes of lesser dimensions, but commensurate with the size of the vessel may be used and the distance apart may be correspondingly reduced. Seven, color specification of lights. The chromaticity of all navigation lights shall conform to the following standards, which lie within the boundaries of the area of the diagram specified for each color by the International Commission on Illumination, CIE. The boundaries of the area for each color are given by indicating the corner coordinates, which are as follows. One, white. X, 0.525, Y, 0.382, X, 0.525, Y, 0.440, X, 0.452, Y, 0.440, X, 0.310, Y, 0.348, X, 0.310, Y, 0.283, X, 0.443, Y 0.382. 2. Green. X, 0.028, Y 0.385, X, 0.009, Y, 0.723, X, 0.300, Y, 0.511, X, 0.203, Y, 0.356. 3. Red. X, 0.680, Y, 0.320, X, 0.660, Y, 0.320, X, 0.735, Y, 0.265, X, 0.721, Y, 0.259. 4. Yellow. X, 0.612, Y, 0.382, X, 0.618, Y, 0.382, X, 0.575, Y, 0.425, X, 0.575, Y, 0.406. Eight, intensity of lights. A, the minimum luminous intensity of lights shall be calculated by using the formula I is equal to 3.43 times 10 to the 6th degree times t times d squared times k to the minus d degree. Where I is luminous intensity in candelas under service conditions, t is threshold factor 2 by 10 to the minus 7 degree lux, d is range of visibility, luminous range, of the light in nautical miles, k is atmospheric transmissivity. For prescribed lights, the value of k shall be 0.8 corresponding to a meteorological visibility of approximately 13 nautical miles.
b. A selection of figures derived from the formula is given in the following table. Range of visibility, luminous range of light in nautical miles, d. Luminous intensity of light in candelas for k equals 0.8, i. d1, i, 0.9, d2, i, 4.3, d3, i, 12, d4, i, 27, d5, i, 52, d6, I-94. Note, the maximum luminous intensity of navigation lights should be limited to avoid undue glare. This shall not be achieved by a variable control of the luminous intensity. Nine, horizontal sectors. A, one, in the forward direction, side lights as fitted on the vessel shall show the minimum required intensities. The intensities must decrease to reach practical cutoff between 1 degree and 3 degrees outside the prescribed sectors. Two, for stern lights and masthead lights and at 22.5 degrees abaft the beam for side lights, the minimum required intensities shall be maintained over the arc of the horizon up to 5 degrees within the limits of the sectors prescribed in Rule 21. From 5 degrees within the prescribed sectors, the intensity may decrease by 50% up to the prescribed limits. It shall decrease steadily to reach practical cutoff at not more than 5 degrees outside the prescribed sectors. B. 1. All-round lights shall be so located as not to be obscured by masts, topmasts or structures within angular sectors of more than 6 degrees, except anchor lights prescribed in Rule 30, which need not be placed at an impracticable height above the hull. 2. If it is impracticable to comply with paragraph B. 1. of this section by exhibiting only one all-round light, two all-round lights shall be used suitably positioned or screened so that they appear, as far as practicable, as one light at a distance of one mile. 1. In order to comply with the one-mile requirement in 9, b. 2, the screening of each all-round light shall be as follows, theta 2 less than or equal to 360 minus theta 1, where, theta 1, screened angle of one all-round light, theta 2, screened angle of the other all-round light, 2, screenings details and the arrangement of obstacles are to be considered when carrying out the drawing approval process. 10. Vertical Sectors A. The vertical sectors of electric lights as fitted, with the exception of lights on sailing vessels underway shall ensure that, 1. At least the required minimum intensity is maintained at all angles from 5 degrees above to 5 degrees below the horizontal. 2. At least 60% of the required minimum intensity is maintained from 7.5 degrees above to 7.5 degrees below the horizontal. B. In the case of sailing vessels underway the vertical sectors of electric lights as fitted shall ensure that, 1. At least the required minimum intensity is maintained at all angles from 5 degrees above to 5 degrees below the horizontal. 2. At least 50% of the required minimum intensity is maintained from 25 degrees above to 25 degrees below the horizontal. 3. In the case of lights other than electric these specifications shall be met as closely as possible. Eleven. Intensity of non-electric lights. Non-electric lights shall so far as practicable comply with the minimum intensities, as specified in the table given in Section 8 of this NX. Twelve maneuvering light. Notwithstanding the provisions of paragraph two f of this annex, the maneuvering light described in Rule 34 
V, shall be placed in the same fore and aft vertical plane as the masthead light or lights and, where practicable, at a minimum height of 2 meters vertically above the forward masthead light, provided that it shall be carried not less than 2 meters vertically above or below the after masthead light. On a vessel where only one masthead light is carried the maneuvering light, if fitted, shall be carried where it can best be seen, not less than 2 meters vertically apart from the masthead light. 13. High-Speed Craft Refer to the International Code of Safety for High-Speed Craft, 1994 and the International Code of Safety for High-Speed Craft, 2000. A. The masthead light of high-speed craft may be placed at a height related to the breadth of the craft lower than that prescribed in paragraph 2, A, 1, of this annex, provided that the base angle of the isosceles triangles formed by the side lights and masthead light, when seen in end elevation, is not less than 27 degrees. B. On high-speed craft of 50 meters or more in length, the vertical separation between foremast and mainmast light of 4.5 meters required by paragraph 2, A, 2, of this annex may be modified provided that such distance shall not be less than the value determined by the following formula. Y equals alpha plus 17 psi multiplied by C divide by 1000 plus 2 where, y is the height of the mainmast light above the foremast light in meters, alpha is the height of the foremast light above the water surface in service condition in meters, psi is the trim in service condition in degrees, c is the horizontal separation of masthead lights in meters. Fourteen, approval. The construction of lanterns and shapes and the installation of lanterns on board the vessel shall be to the satisfaction of the appropriate authority of the state whose flag the vessel is entitled to fly. International Regulations for Preventing Collisions at Sea Annex 2 Additional Signals for Fishing Vessels Fishing in Close Proximity 1. General The lights mentioned herein shall, if exhibited in pursuance of Rule 26, d. be placed where they can best be seen. They shall be at least 0.9 meter apart, but at a lower level than lights prescribed in Rule 26, B, 1, and C, 1. The lights shall be visible all round the horizon at a distance of at least 1 mile, but at a lesser distance than the lights prescribed by these rules for fishing vessels. 2. Signals for Trawlers a. Vessels of 20 meters of more in length when engaged in trawling, whether using demersal or pelagic gear shall exhibit. 1. When shooting their nets, two white lights in a vertical line. 2. When hauling their nets, one white light over one red light in a vertical line. 3. When the net has come fast upon an obstruction, two red lights in a vertical line. b. Each vessel of 20 meters or more in length engaged in pair trawling shall exhibit 1. By night, a searchlight directed forward and in the direction of the other vessel of the pair 2. When shooting or hauling their nets or when their nets have come fast upon an obstruction, the lights prescribed in 2. a. Above c. A vessel of less than 20 meters in length engaged in trawling, whether using demersal or pelagic gear or engaged in pair trawling, may exhibit the lights prescribed in paragraphs a or b of this section as appropriate. Three, signals for purse saners. Vessels engaged in fishing with purse sane gear may exhibit two yellow lights in a vertical line. These lights shall flash alternately every second and with equal light and occultation duration. 
These lights may be exhibited only when the vessel is hampered by its fishing gear. International Regulations for Preventing Collisions at Sea NX3 Technical Details of Sound Signal Appliances A. Frequencies and Range of Audibility The fundamental frequency of the signal shall lie within the range 70 to 700 Hz. The range of audibility of the signal from a whistle shall be determined by those frequencies which may include the fundamental and or one or more higher frequencies, which lie within the range 180 to 700 Hz, plus or minus 1%, for a vessel of 20 meters or more in length, or 180 to 2100 Hz, plus or minus 1%, for a vessel of less than 20 meters in length and which provide the sound pressure levels specified in paragraph 1, C, below. b. Limits of fundamental frequencies To ensure a wide variety of whistle characteristics, the fundamental frequency of a whistle shall be between the following limits, 1, 70 to 200 Hz, for a vessel 200 meters or more in length, 2, 130 to 350 Hz, for a vessel 75 meters but less than 200 meters in length, 3, 250 to 700 Hz, for a vessel less than 75 meters in length. C. Sound signal intensity and range of audibility. A whistle fitted in a vessel shall provide, in the direction of maximum intensity of the whistle and at a distance of 1 meter from it, a sound pressure level in at least 1 1 3rd octave band within the range of frequencies 180 to 700 Hz, plus or minus 1%, for a vessel of 20 meters or more in length, or 180 to 2100 Hz, plus or minus 1%. For a vessel of less than 20 meters in length, of not less than the appropriate figure given in the table below. D. Directional Properties The sound pressure level of a directional whistle shall be not more than 4 dB below the prescribed sound pressure level on the axis at any direction in the horizontal plane within plus or minus 45 degrees of the axis. The sound pressure level at any other direction in the horizontal plane shall be not more than 10 dB below the prescribed sound pressure level on the axis, so that the range in any direction will be at least half the range on the forward axis. The sound pressure level shall be measured in that one-third octave band which determines the audibility range. E. Positioning of whistles. When a directional whistle is to be used as the only whistle on a vessel, it shall be installed with its maximum intensity directed straight ahead. A whistle shall be placed as high as practicable on a vessel, in order to reduce interception of the emitted sound by obstructions and also to minimize hearing damage risk to personnel. The sound pressure level of the vessel's own signal at listening posts shall not exceed 110 A weighted decibels and so far as practicable should not exceed 100 A weighted decibels. F. Fitting of more than one whistle. If whistles are fitted at a distance apart of more than 100 meters, it shall be so arranged that they are not sounded simultaneously. G. Combined Whistle Systems if due to the presence of obstructions, the sound field of a single whistle or of one of the whistles referred to in paragraph 1, F, above is likely to have a zone of greatly reduced signal level, it is recommended that a combined whistle system be fitted so as to overcome this reduction. For the purposes of the rules a combined whistle system is to be regarded as a single whistle. 
The whistles of a combined system shall be located at a distance apart of not more than 100 meters and arranged to be sounded simultaneously. The frequency of any one whistle shall differ from those of the others by at least 10 hertz. 2. Bell or Gong A. Intensity of Signal A bell or gong, or other device having similar sound characteristics, shall produce a sound pressure level of not less than 110 decibels at a distance of 1 meter from it. B. Construction Bells and gongs shall be made of corrosion-resistant material and designed to give a clear tone. The diameter of the mouth of the bell shall be not less than 300 millimeters for vessels of 20 meters or more in length. Where practicable, a power-driven bell striker is recommended to ensure constant force, but manual operation shall be possible. The mass of the striker shall be not less than 3% of the mass of the bell. 3. Approvals the construction of sound signal appliances, their performance, and their installation on board the vessel shall be to the satisfaction of the appropriate authority of the state whose flag the vessel is entitled to fly. International Regulations for Preventing Collisions at Sea Annex 4 Distress Signals 1. The following signals, used or exhibited either together or separately, indicate distress and need of assistance. a. A gun or other explosive signals fired at intervals of about a minute. b. A continuous sounding with any fog signaling apparatus. c. Rockets or shells, throwing red stars fired one at a time at short intervals. D. A signal made by any signaling method consisting of the group 3 short 3 prolonged 3 short SOS in the Morse code. E. A signal sent by radio telephony consisting of the spoken word Mayday. F. The International Code Signal of Distress Indicated by November Charlie G. A signal consisting of a square flag having above or below it a ball or anything resembling a ball. H, flames on the vessel, as from a burning tar barrel, oil barrel, etc. I, a rocket parachute flare, or a hand flare, showing a red light. J, a smoke signal giving off orange colored smoke.
K, slowly and repeatedly raising and lowering arms outstretched to each side. L, a distress alert by means of digital selective calling, DSC, transmitted on, 1, VHF channel 70, or, 2, MF, HF on the frequencies 2187.5 kHz, 8414.5 kHz, 4207.5 kHz, 6312 kHz. 12,577 kilohertz or 16,804.5 kilohertz. M, a ship to shore distress alert transmitted by the ships in Marsat or other mobile satellite service provider ship earth station. N, signals transmitted by emergency position indicating radio beacons. O, approved signals transmitted by radio communication systems, including survival craft radar transponders. Two, the use or exhibition of any of the foregoing signals, except for the purpose of indicating distress and need of assistance and the use of other signals which may be confused with any of the above signals, is prohibited. Three, attention is drawn to the relevant sections of the International Code of Signals, the International Aeronautical and Maritime Search and Rescue Manual, Volume 3, and the following signals. A, a piece of orange-colored canvas with either a black square and circle or other appropriate symbol for identification from the air. B, a die marker, 